Perfect. Thank you, Roshni. Hi, everyone. I'm Brenda Lamy, Vice President at the Canadian College of Health Leaders, and it's with pleasure that I welcome you to the first of a three-part series of webinars on empowering women leaders. It's particularly my pleasure to welcome you today as we celebrate International Women's Day. We begin by respectfully acknowledging that we are hosting today from the traditional territories and ancestral lands of the Indigenous, Métis and Inuit peoples. We invite you to take a moment to reflect on the cultural importance of these lands as we honor those who have walked before us along with those still to come and to reaffirming our commitment to forging culturally safe relationships on our pathway towards reconciliation. Please join me in also acknowledging the Indigenous culture of knowledge sharing that leverages collective experiences and allows people to learn from one another. It's in that spirit of mutual respect and collaboration that we come together today. We would like to thank all the dedicated college members, health workers, industry partners, and leaders who are working diligently to manage and lead through the COVID-19 pandemic. Your efforts and ongoing commitment are seen, felt, and appreciated. I will now turn to my colleague, Kelly Grimes, the Executive Director at the Canadian Health Leadership Network to introduce today's speakers. Over to you, Kelly. Thanks, Brenda. As Brenda mentioned, today is International Women's Day. That began 110 years ago to improve the working conditions for women around the world. It seems so appropriate to introduce the terrific work that Do Dr. Ivy Brojot and her team have done on developing and empowering women leaders toolkit. CHLN has been a long-standing partner with Ivy because of her ability to turn evidence into practice, and we greatly value this relationship. If you're not familiar, with Ivy. Her CV is really long, but briefly, she's the University of Ottawa Chair in Gender Diversity and the Professions and founded the Canadian Health Leadership. At, whoops, I almost said mine, the Canadian Health Workforce Net Network, another fabulous network. She's joined today by Billie Jean Hermosura, a dietitian and PH Kent PhD candidate at the University of Ottawa, who began working with Ivy on this project um, in 2019. So I have a couple of housekeeping uh, tips before we get into the work by Ivy and her team. The Zoom webinar will be one hour in length. The presentation will be 45 minutes and we'll have Q&A at the end in the last 15 minutes. The link will be sent to everyone following the session for this webinar. So you, again, you can share it and look at it later. If our voices are not loud enough during the presentation, please let us know in the chat box. And as our speakers are presenting, as mentioned earlier, we encourage you to type your questions in the Q&A box. And in the last 15 minutes, we will address them. Um, you will be able to see all the questions asked. And if there's a question you really want answered, click on the thumbs up to move that question higher in the queue. So that's it for me. And I'm gonna turn it over to Ivy and Billy Jane. That's super. Thank you so much for those introductions. And I'm just hoping that the slide deck is viewable. Okay, that's great. Um, so thank you again. We're really pleased to be doing this presentation on International Women's Day. We thank our hosts, um, Leeds and the Canadian College of Health Leaders and our partners with the Canadian Health Leadership Network. And um, I think that we've already gone through introductions, but they will be on uh, your um, slide decks here. And so just to give you a sense of what our overview is going to be looking at, um, we wanted to have something really practical out of this project. And so we wanted to create these toolkits of promising practice in, in support of inclusive leadership. And we wanted to put that in a place where you were already there on the Leeds community of practice. So we're really pleased about having that partnership. So a little bit of background about our community of practice, the Empowering Women Leaders um, Initiative. We had funding from States Women Canada, and it was really to build and sustain capacity through two interrelated objectives, developing a strong and supportive network and community of practice among established and emerging leaders and to develop and implement evidence informed tools to bring about transformative systemic change. And so we've curated onto the LEADS um, Community for Practice platform some of these key evidence-informed tools into a set of overlapping toolkits. 
So a little bit about our toolkits. So what we're going to be talking about today is a set of equity, diversity and inclusion toolkits and we use the short form EDI. And um, these are curated on the, uh, or these are mapped onto the Leads platform curated, um, sorry, mapped onto the Leads framework curated on the Leads platform. What is in the toolkit is first we provide a short primer on why one needs to focus on inclusive leadership in the specific domains that we were looking at. And briefly, those are healthcare, health sciences, and Indigenous health. We are not going to go through those today, but I, but I want to link you to uh, the YouTube video that we've uh, prepared um, as a backgrounder. So that gets at the why or the business case. So today we're going to focus on how and uh, how do we improve these things. I also want to mention that we created two other toolkits, what we call ally toolkits, uh, to support diverse uh, leadership. Um, and that's in part because it's not just about women making the change, men are also to be involved in that. So we have an allied toolkit and we'll be doing a webinar on March 22nd. And that we are looking at diverse women's leadership. So in terms of Indigenous identity and racialization, um, sexuality, disability. And so we created an allied toolkit in support of diverse leadership writ large and we'll be presenting that in a webinar on the 29th. So as I mentioned, our toolkit is situated on the Leeds Community for Practice platform. This is a bit of an image of what it looks like. So we have a bit about the um, initiative, the Empowering Women Leaders in Health Home. Uh, we have the EDI toolkits, which is what we're going to go through today. We have our ally toolkits um, as well. There's a discussion forum which exists on the Community of Practice platform. And there are some additional resources, links up to additional videos, full videos, um, a glossary that Billy Jane has meticulously gone through and made sure that everything is there. So I'm going to pass over to Billy Jane now, who will walk us through the first few elements of the toolkit. Thanks, Ivy. So we conducted an extensive literature review and leads aligned with the framework we used to develop the toolkit. Um, we also received feedback from our learning lab participants who encouraged us to use the LEADS framework as it was quite complementary. Um, so there was no need to create something different. So um, as Ivy mentioned, uh, each of the sections of the toolkit has a glossary of the key terms and concepts of which some of these will be referred to today. So next slide, please. Uh, so to begin um, at the lead self level, um, this begins by recognizing first that we all have unconscious or implicit biases, including what uh, constitutes a leader. So we go through that in the toolkit. Uh, second, um, we have privileges or um, disadvantages related to our social identities. So we touch on this in the toolkit as well, and this could be gender, racial, sexuality, indigenous status or disability identities, as well as social class backgrounds. And third, um, an EDI informed leadership journey includes time and attention towards addressing and unlearning these often taken for granted assumptions. Uh, next slide. So the toolkit covers ways to support leading an EDI informed self which includes uh, recognizing and unlearning biased assumptions about leadership. So I'll start with uh, leading as your authentic self, then highlight how to beat imposter syndrome. So throughout the toolkit, we have a number of photo quotes uh, that we hope uh, illustrates key points and represents some of the key concept, concepts. So here's one example. Um, because masculinity is linked with leadership, uh, women often feel they have to lead in a masculine way to be seen as a leader. So here we have a quote from Dr. Kernahan, which highlights leading with authenticity. So a key part of being authentic means being grounded in your values. Next slide. 
So in the toolkit, we have a section on ways to beat imposter syndrome. Um, it's not just about how you feel of, um, about yourself, but it's also about how others make you feel. So here's an example of content that we will add to the section on imposter syndrome, uh, which are additional steps and strategies. So um, the toolkit is not static. It's a living and breathing toolkit. So if there's um, any resources or uh, information that you think we should add, uh, feel free to share those with us. So uh, next, we will move on to managing an EDI-informed self. So here's an example of um, us bringing in uh, some popular uh, book information. So the idea of leading in or leaning in was drawn from a popular book written by Sheryl Sandberg, the chief operating officer at Facebook uh, called Lean In. So her main argument is that women need to develop the confidence to say yes to opportunities and demand their seat at the leadership table. So Sandberg's influence and the popularity of this book led to the creation of an organization called leanin.org. So there are some interesting um, personal practice, practices to learn from the book and the Lean In community. So developing self-awareness, humility, courage, and resilience are important for women to move through their leadership journeys. It also resonates with the leads, uh, lead self-focus and encouragement to lead from where you are. Uh, next slide. So as another example, uh, throughout the toolkit, we also draw from uh, Twitter and other uh, social media. So a big caution is, you know, however, we know from the long history of feminist literature uh, that women face cultural and structural barriers in the workplace. So here we have um, is an image uh, from Twitter. Uh, so we have a tweet from one of our colleagues, uh, Jamie Lundeen which says, if you lean in and there's no one there to support you, you might just fall over. So we carefully curated um, quotes from Twitter uh, that we've included throughout the toolkit. Next slide. Um, and recognizing and accommodating differences um, such as diversity management are key EDI skills but they also require significant emotional labor. So in part, because pushback should be expected, um, managing an EDI informed self uh, means as the following image details, um, picking your battles carefully. So taking charge at a lead self level will not be enough to counter systemic biases and discrimination, which brings us to our next slide. So we move into engaging others. Uh, so when engaging, uh, when engaging leaders build teams and foster the development of others, they strive to recognize who they are and are not engaging. So upon that reflection, uh, they develop strategies to reach out to people who have been historically overlooked as leaders. This might include developing mentoring and sponsorship relationships with emerging leaders from diverse backgrounds and attending to ongoing succession plans. So the toolkit covers uh, topics to support engaging others in an EDI informed way. Um, I'll start with uh, fostering inclusion through online and social networking. So in this slide, uh, the idea of networking is not often defined and can be uh, taken for granted uh, within a professional context and thus sort of reinforce inequitable social structures. Um, it's imperative for organizations to create space for alternative avenues of networking and ensure that all leaders and prospective leaders benefit from expanded access to networking opportunities. So in the toolkit, we encourage inclusive leaders to engage on social media. And a few examples are on this slide. Um, it's a means to work around barriers to more traditional in-person networking activities and opportunities. 
So next I will talk about fostering the development of others through mentorship, sponsorship, and allyship. Again, a glossary of these terms are included uh, at the end of the toolkit for each section. So while mentorship programs are invaluable to women's success in leadership positions, conventional networking and mentorship may not be fully enhancing women's careers. Um, women can be uh, over-mentored yet under-supported. Um, it's important that organizations tap into diverse and non-traditional forms of networking to improve recruitment and retention of women leaders. And this could include using social media as a means to build and sustain connections. So here again is a, a photo quote, um, mentorship can and should be a two-way relationship. So mentors can learn from their mentees as much as the other way around. Uh, research has shown that mentors come to believe that their protégés merit opportunities and in turn, their sponsorships help give protégés the break that they need to develop and advance in their career. So Dr. Gautam shares her key learnings about mentoring and that you don't need to be monogamous in your mentoring relationship. And she encourages women to have as many mentors as they can. So this is an important consideration for women leaders. Um, use your network and consider having more than one mentor. So lastly, um, to build more diverse, effective, and inclusive teams. Um, fostering diversity in health teams is important, not just from an equity perspective, but also it enhances effectiveness. So the toolkit, toolkit includes um, resources in this area. So next, Ivy will cover uh, achieving results. Thanks, Billy Jane. So yes, the next A um, really is looking at within organizations and encouraging goal-oriented leaders to dedicate resources to addressing equity, diversity, and inclusion. So some of the key A topics that are in the toolkit is first creating and implementing an EDI organizational change cycle. This gets at the how and the what of EDI change from who you're hiring to promoting all along that spectrum. And we also include some cautionary practices around targets or quotas and how to integrate gender bias and diversity training. So just as an example of an organizational change cycle, we draw upon this example, a seven step program to improve gender diversity at work that we uh, drew from Favreau and McDonald. And I won't go through all of the details here, but to highlight that there's a cyclical phenomena. There's focusing at the strategic level, the tactical level, and the operational level. And so it's to look at this type of change cycle to see what you can um, adopt and adapt within your own organization, but measuring and making sure that you are um, making change along the way. Another example is to look at the issue of targets versus quotas, targets being more soft and quotas being a harder um, to, to reach. And we wanted to kind of turn it inside out. And we thought that this was a really um, interesting paper that we referenced, quotas for men, which has us reframe gender quotas as not sort of focused on women, but focused on how many men do you need to have in a particular decision-making committee or board or in leadership roles. And the arguments from this particular piece uh, noted that it promotes meritocracy, so a focus on merit, and that it improves the criteria to select and evaluate those who are coming into a particular leadership position, and that it neutralizes overly masculinized environments. Other key A topics that we've included in the toolkit is how to move to being a gender aware organization and hopefully moving to a gender justice based organization and really looking at culture. And one of the elements that we highlight there, which is really quite salient in a pandemic context, is 
recognizing the emotional labor and care work that's involved with everybody in your organization. So changing to a gender aware organizational culture will be recognizing care work not only at home, such as when scheduling meetings or events or networking opportunities, but also sharing the less recognized and less valued care work at work, the birthday cards, the birthday cakes, those sorts of things that is the gel that holds teams together. And recognizing the implications of the emotional labor involved with care work, both at home and at work, including, as Billy Jane mentioned, the EDI uh, work. Other key A topics that we have is redefining leadership uh, within your organization and opting for a more collective or distributed leadership model over a conventional in a position of authority leadership model. And we have some elements in the toolkit that address that. So I'll pass it back to Billy Jane to do the D. So just as EDI considerations inform leadership capabilities uh, within one's discipline, group or organization, um, it also translates to the development of coalitions with others. So the 4D in the LEADS framework. Um, collaborative leaders develop coalitions to create EDI awareness and achieve EDI goals within and across disciplines, groups and organizations. So uh, developing EDI-focused uh, coalitions uh, across organizations can help to achieve EDI results uh, locally in one's organization. So one strategy I will highlight is through uh, mentorship. Uh, so this is a visual here to highlight the notion of a common cause, a common direction, and a movement with direction when it comes to developing coalitions. Um, throughout the toolkit, we also have um, different uh, visuals and infographics, um, which we've also described um, for accessibility. So there has been a long history of um, social inequities. Uh, being brought before the courts to facilitate social change on uh, two issues. So uh, two issues, uh, two key EDI initiatives include pay equity coalitions and equity in awards in healthcare and health sciences. So here's a quote from Dr. Silvers. Um, so for any award in medicine and in healthcare, there are more than zero women who can be nominated or awarded. So women in medicine and other healthcare and health science fields uh, deserve recognition. However, many do not um, receive it. So lastly, for this section, um, take action on inequity through conferences. So conferences represent an important coalition building venue that brings together leaders across organizations with similar professional interests. Um, they are spaces for knowledge sharing and visibility. So although um, much progress has been made in making gender balance a priority, there is still a lack of gender diversity in many events and conferences. So the toolkit includes visual, visual representation on some ways you can respond to the typical excuses for poor uh, representation at conferences. Uh, so this is one example. Um, so Gender Avenger is an organization that looks to ensure women are represented in the public dialogue. Um, they wrote a blog on how to respond to excuses that we hear when women are not included in events and conferences. So here are um, two examples. So before I go on to system transformation, I'll just build off of that last example that Billy Jane highlighted. And it's not so much about having an equal number of people there. It's also about having an equal voice um, at these events. Um, we've heard um, uh, since we collected some of these documents during the pandemic on Zoom calls, 
Uh, women have great difficulty being able to interrupt and be heard. And there was also recent data um, released about the quality of interactions uh, for women's presentation. And this was specific to women in economics, um, but there was a whole um, conversation on Twitter um, about how disproportionately uh, women are treated in a very negative way, asked very critical questions um, and their expertise um, questioned. And so these are some examples of new items that we're hoping to add to the toolkit. And as Billy Jane mentioned, we're hoping to have you um, let us know of some others that we should curate. So as I mentioned at the outset, the project was really focused on transformative systemic change. And so that lends itself very nicely to the last item of the LEADS framework system transformation. And that successful leaders foster systemic change and not just systemic change in healthcare and in health sciences and indigenous health, but systemic change in the gender system. So some of the key S topics that we have in the toolkit is de developing collective leadership for systemic change and embedding an anti-bias approach to collective leadership writ large. Also looking at seeking external agency to support um, uh, established EDI criteria across organizations. And I'll talk about a specific example of times up healthcare in the United States. Um, and then also seeking government support where possible and appropriate for action on equity, diversity and inclusion. And an example that we highlight in the toolkit is the dimensions program, which is to bring about much more explicit EDI within health sciences and sciences in general. So specifically about the Times Up healthcare example, they have highlighted how sexual harassment, gender inequality, sexual assault, which disproportionately happens in healthcare, more so than in other uh, domains of science, has an impact on women's leadership journeys and women's sustainability within, uh, within this area. And so it builds off of the Time's Up movement more broadly and has created this um, organization, Time's Up Healthcare. So it is based in the United States, but there are many members who are Canadian and many of the tools are transferable. So we highlight some of these in the toolkit for you to um, go out to, um, have a look at, again, consider um, adopting or adapting for your particular context. So again, what we are trying to change here is the system. We are trying to shift our focus, but include um, our role as individuals in this change, but moving towards more institutional and systemic change from the L to the S in the LEADS framework. And we also want to move this from the informal sector that we do individually off the sides of our desk or behind the scenes to something that's more formalized or part of the organization. So in conclusion, I, we also wanted to mention that we want people to use this toolkit. So it has been created uh, under a license of the Creative Commons. And so anybody is able to share, copy and redistribute the materials, adapt them and adopt them, uh, remix them, tell us how it's working, what you did and how we might want to augment that. This is all about the evidence base that we're bringing together. And as long as you use all of the materials within the license framework, you are able to do so. We just, we don't want anybody to, um, uh, to create, you know, proprietary materials out of it. We just really want to see the change. So in closing, um, again, I'm very pleased that we had this opportunity to engage with you on International Women's Day to really take that and move forward. These are the different ways that you can follow us on Twitter and Facebook, LinkedIn, and we have a lot of materials up on YouTube and um, a link to all of this is on the Empowering Women Leaders webpage on the Canadian College of Health Leaders website. So thanks everyone.
Thank you, Ivy and Billy Jane. That was a really terrific overview. And I haven't heard in a while, and there's always new content, which I find so interesting. Um, so one question in the chat is, we use the terms all the time, mantles and wannels. Can you explain the difference for everybody? Yeah, absolutely. So mantles are male only panels, mantles. Um, wannels are white only panels. And again, our our project here is not just about getting more white women into positions of authority, that's important. Um, but we wanted to look at equity, diversity, inclusion writ large because all of the arguments that we make about getting more women to the table apply to diversity um, at the tables and, and Billy Jane made uh, excellent reference to that earlier. Good, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, it's funny how it rolls off our tongues and we don't even realize after a while. Mm -hmm. So a few questions were sent ahead of time. And one is, what can people in middle management positions do for the cause? That's a really um, good point. And I'm going to have um, Billy Jane sort of speak specifically to, to some of this after I give a few uh, little examples, because Billy Jane has more experience in healthcare than I do. Um, but we, but again, the reason why we wanted to do this in partnership with the Canadian Health Leadership Network and the Canadian College of Health Leaders is because management is a really important um, intervention point. They, they do set the tone uh, for the culture. And so many of these tools can be adopted um, by folks who are on their leadership journey. Um, and, and we hope that People use this as an opportunity. I was hearing um, earlier today that you know people management skills are some of the important skills that one has as a manager, but one doesn't get training in that. And we're hoping that this toolkit will provide you know some evidence informed tools and resources to provide a bit of that background. Maybe Billy Jane has some more examples you know from her experience. Yeah, and I think that also in middle man management, there's opportunity to um, sort of start cultivating that culture shift a little bit. And um, just sorry, and I see another question here um, in the chat, um, in the Q&A about uh, suggestions regarding networking um, and what, uh, what could we share here. The, the toolkit does include some additional suggestions for women um, to uh, network. And I think that middle management can help sort of facilitate that, um, helping women to sort of get in touch with other uh, potential opportunities. Um, women, you know, as uh, was encouraged, uh, are encouraged to say yes to some of these um, opportunities that may stretch them a little bit. Um, but I think that uh, managers can certainly, certainly help facilitate that. Um, encouraging women to um, really focus on a specific area um, that they might be able to seek out mentorship. So sorry, drawing back to Dr. Uh, Gautam's um, photo quote, uh, she encouraged us to um, really look at um, having more than one mentor and a mentor can really help you focus on a key area that you want to develop. Um, so I think those are uh, ways that um, middle management can help facilitate those opportunities, but as well for women to uh, use their networks uh, in different areas, because many of us have more than one network that we're a part of, and it doesn't necessarily mean network in a sort of formal sense, um, but we can certainly take advantage of that. Yeah, and those are really important. And just to kind of build on on that for this last question around um, around networking, um, keep in mind that most of the evidence that we curated for the toolkit uh, was pre pandemic. And so networking in a virtual context is going to be very different. And that's why it's really important for us to refresh um, the toolkit recognizing this new environment. I mean, we were promoting um, you know, using social media as a way to network because of those barriers to, you know, getting to events. Um, conferences are mostly online now. So some of those traditional uh, barriers are not there. However, um, there are some new ones that have propped up. So we really want to take into consideration that new, that new context. So if there's anything that you've seen out there that you think is really promising, um, send it along to us and we're happy to pull together some information and integrate it within uh, within the platform. 
Perfect. Thank you. So another question from Jennifer. How can you respectfully, respectfully call out mm. other women who are not behaving as supportive to other women? Suggestions? Yeah, so I'll start and then I'll ask Billy and um, Jane to provide um, a bit of background. And um, and also this is a bit of the precursor to why we developed a separate ally toolkit for diverse um, leadership, diverse women's leadership um, in general. Um, because we had some circumstances that, you know, were a bit shocking to us and we go, did she just say that out loud? And then we had to kind of confront that um, in a way and, and figure out how to confront it. So we did get advice, you know, from women who've experienced this before, Black and Indigenous and women of color about how they go about it and recognizing all of the emotional labor that uh, this entails um, is sort of highlighting what was mentioned and say, I know that you probably didn't mean it this way, but somebody could interpret what you said as meaning blah, 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 blah. And what it does is it focuses on what they said and not about them. Um, I know that that's difficult to do in the moment. And sometimes, and what, what, what happens, and one of the things that we want to incorporate in the toolkit is this notion of the big freeze. When something remarkable like that happens, we all kind of freeze and just go, how do we deal with that? And that's to empower people to, and, and it's a, a lot of it is through giving people some language to use and uh, to get them beyond that freeze um, because those are, that can be very challenging um, situations. Billy Jane, do you have um, something to add there? Um, I, yeah, and I wanted to maybe just say that um, it sort of goes back to, um, what Dr. Kernahan, um, that one, the first photo quote that I had shared was just um, some of us when, um, are socialized um, to lead in a, what might be considered a masculine way. And that um, may come as a surprise or uh, just sit well uh, differently um, when we're, uh, you know, women to women. So I, I think that um, Part of, part of that is recognizing um, what a masculine way of leading is. And um, maybe, you know, uh, like what Ivy was saying, many of us may not um, intend to lead that way. Uh, so that having uh, the right words and language to use when um, communicating with other women might help to, again, sort of change how we interact with one another. Um, the other thing to that is um, if uh, you're not feeling comfortable or safe to um, you know, talk to the other person, um, maybe that's another opportunity uh, going back to the first question. Um, if you feel comfortable talking to uh, a pe another peer or uh, someone uh, in middle management uh, to consult uh, for uh, other effective ways to uh, facilitate difficult conversations. Yeah, I would absolutely echo that, Billie Jean, that sometimes it doesn't have to be you calling that out. Sometimes you can bring it quietly to someone's attention and that they can do it if they have more, you know, uh, social capital within the organization um, to do that. Um, it also raised uh, one of the examples that Billie Jean had on her slide in terms of, you know, we talk about microaggressions. And there's an element of the toolkit that talks about, you know, how to become an active bystander. So this is one of those issues. So it may be directed at you or maybe directed at somebody else, but how to be an active bystander. And we've copied that into the uh, male ally toolkit because they need to be active bystanders as well. Um, and we have an, um, a new photo quote that we'll be adding to the male ally toolkit uh, from, um, from a junior colleague who said that sometimes that's very difficult for him to do as well. Um, so um, how do we how do we foster those allies? And one of the other things that we that we mentioned and, and Billy Jane highlighted that at the beginning is that we all have implicit bias. We are all socialized into this particular gender system that privileges men. Um, and so we've we we build that in, right? Um, you know, I was having a conversation earlier with a student, and I have quotes on my slides. Um, and she said, um, 
you know, Dr. Robertson that you have on this slide, what he was saying, blah, blah, blah. And I said, well, actually, um, that's my colleague, Ann Robertson, it's she. And so we had a bit of a conversation about how we automatically assume that if someone is referenced and it's an academic, that it's he. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's very interesting. I know Ivy, when we work together, you always say to anybody in the working groups who are leaders, be comfortable with being uncomfortable mm -hmm. as you're going through these processes. Yeah. Um, so, so we have another question. Uh, does your toolkit provide resources around supporting and encouraging women who are on maternity leave or going on maternity leave or even thinking about going on maternity leave so that they have as many opportunities for career advancements? Wow. Yeah, that's a very, very interesting, um, it's a very interesting question. And I'm going to preface that by just acknowledging the evidence that there is out there. So this is in science, this is not in healthcare. Um, and we have too little research um, on the implications that maternity leaves have for women's leadership journey. Um, in science, uh, and this is American data. So again, it's looking at a very different context for maternity leaves, maternity and paternity leaves, uh, the United States being one of the few um, high income countries that does not have um, equitable provision for maternity leaves. But women who uh, become pregnant, have children, go on leave, are much less likely to come back into a career in science. The majority still do, so that's important to highlight. The majority do, like 75%, but in comparison to men uh, who have children, it's in the range of 2.5 or three times more women do not continue on in a career in science. And that's you know finishing off their PhD, doing a postdoc, getting into an academic position. So I want to just acknowledge that there is some evidence out there of this being an off-ramp for uh, one's leadership journey. So I think just knowing that um, and uh, working with an organization to, and, and this is where leadership is really important, um, trying to create systems and structures to recognize that that's a, a tendency to happen and what is it that you need to do. And some of that is, you know, in the, in the slide, uh, that we have the organizational culture. Don't have meetings, you know, at times where, uh, you know, women are taking care um, of children. Um, because this doesn't just stop with maternity leave. You have children and disproportionately that falls upon women. Although if more men take paternity leaves, they are more likely to participate in parenting activities. Canadian men are some of the least likely to take paternity leave. Um, and so that I think is an important aspect that that needs to change. Um, so those would be some things that that I would highlight and it's a really important question. Billy Jane, do you have something you want to add? I don't have anything to add to that. <laughs> <laughs> so so we have another question from Kelly. Working many years in a profession that's dominated by women, nursing, which is 80%. Um, I've been I've been over mentored, under supported. Can you elaborate a bit more on this and some strategies to mitigate the risk of this happening? Who wants to take this on? I'm gonna ha let Billy Jane, yeah, because you know <laughs> this in in dietetics as well. Yeah, so um, I think sort of just building on what uh, we shared earlier, um, part of making this uh, as regular practice, I think, in terms of day to day. Uh, so when you have these um, mentorship programs, if you're able to sort of make it a part of your every day and having uh, not just the program, but also uh, trying to build on and further develop um, peer mentorship programs. Um, and it's not necessarily um, someone who has more experience and um, taking on a trainee. Um, this can definitely be um, colleagues um, at a very similar um, career stage. Um, I find that uh, 
in my experience talking with not just uh, dietitians, so within my profession, but also with like nursing colleagues, I think there's lots of opportunity um, to also develop um, interprofessional mentorship. Um, I think in some contexts that could be also underutilized, um, but in a very effective way to um, spread out that um, support uh, within uh, a unit and across professions. Yeah, I think that's an excellent example of, um, you know, because nurses, and especially now during the pandemic, right, everyone is really stressed to the max. And so thinking about, you know, mentoring uh, is just outside of the realm of possibility uh, for many right now. So looking across, you know, different professions, different professional roles, I think that's an excellent idea. Um, but you also make this distinction, Kelly, between being mentored and supported. And um, in the uh, Male Ally Toolkit, uh, we talk about um, the issue of sponsorship as well. So it's not just, you know, telling people what to do, but it's um, opening doors for people, making those introductions. And um, uh, Bill Thal, one of our uh, he for she allies, talks about sort of kicking down doors for people. And um, it's about utilizing your mentors, again, mentors mm -hmm. uh, in different sectors very wisely and saying, do you know this person? Could you make an introduction for me to this person? Because a friendly introduction is so much better than a cold email, you know, um, out of the blue. Um, you know, typically in making the introduction, your sponsor says something nice about you. Um, so that, you know, that really helps. So don't be afraid to ask people to make introductions for you, to kind of give them a little bit of background um, in doing so. And um, that would be another way um, that I would definitely su suggest that. So thanks. Good, thank you, Ivy. So we have another question from Shanna. Speaking to gender binary, do, do your ally toolkits speak to empowering and amplifying the voices of trans women, trans women of color? Absolutely. And so we have tried to um, integrate equity, diversity, inclusion in the EDI toolkits, which were about, you know, first initially about empowering women leaders in general. So we've really tried to integrate that, but we also have a separate toolkit, which gets at this more broadly. And the purpose of that toolkit is not only to support women from diverse backgrounds in their journey, but also just to understand uh, what allyship entails, um, the importance of listening. And, um, and so we do include some information in there about um, Two Spirit in the Indigenous Women's Leadership section. Um, and that was you know, strongly encouraged by one of our, our team members, um, Dr. Karen Lawford. Uh, we have put information there about supporting trans men, trans women in that and gender diverse um, leadership and trying to really encourage people to think beyond the binary, recognizing that we wanted a set of evidence-based toolkits. The evidence is incredibly binary. So we have that tension um, in the in the toolkit. Um, but again, we are continuing to, to build resources and there's some stuff that I came across just in doing um, some of my some of my teaching about um, trans health, some really great um, resources, you know, from Rainbow Health Ontario um, about you know how you um, speak to folks, and then we did a, another toolkit about mental health in the workplace, and I uh, we wanted to create a vignette about um, issues of um, transitioning at work and what implications that have, you know, for stigma and uh, disclosure. And I had an absolutely fascinating conversation uh, with someone who has taken on a leadership role in the public service to inform people. And across all of those cases, like the, one of the biggest no, um, items that we have in our ally toolkit is the importance of listening listening and learning. And um, Christine, the person, uh, the transgender woman that I spoke to said, think about you know when you were a child and you were trying to understand something and you weren't judging, right? And it was to kind of, um, she said to be childlike um, in that way. And I thought that that was a really great 
um, example, and we, we made sure that it was in our um, mental health toolkit. And so this is something that we're going to incorporate here. So yeah, thank you for that question, Shanna. Billy Jane, did you want to add anything? No, I, I think what Ivy said is very thorough, but I mean, as I mentioned, um, the toolkit is evolving and um, in response to um, all the uh, social justice events that happened um, in 2020 and, and have continued, um, we started to um, really uh, add to the allyship um, a toolkit and um, one of our colleagues, Ruth, um, played a key part in um, curating a lot of that content. Um, so we recognize that um, this is definitely a toolkit that I think will um, evolve probably even more rapidly because there's so much um, interesting work and resources being done in the, um, to address this uh, this need. Um, so uh, if um, Shanna and if others have um, some direction that we and resources that we can sort of look at, that would be excellent. Perfect. Um, so Ivy, back to your point about a childlike approach to this. For people, this is new to them. Tell us the difference between unconscious bias and microaggressions. And you know how people maybe examples and how people can think about it in their everyday work. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so unconscious bias is something that we all have. So I think it's really important to be inclusive about recognizing our biases. And um, you know when I teach, and I teach to a really diverse um, group of students, um, men and women, gender diverse individuals, um, all different sort of backgrounds in terms of indigenous settler immigrants. And it's important to kind of tell everybody that we are all sexist, we are all racist because we've all been socialized into these systems. And, um, you know, we're, we're just at a different part of this pathway to being more, you know, gender aware or um, focusing on a more racial um, uh, justice um, approach. And, um, and thank you, Kelly, for highlighting, you know, that quote um, is, becoming comfortable with being uncomfortable um, because and that's a really important part of leadership is recognizing where there's discomfort and not being afraid to kind of um, go there. So unconscious bias is just noting that we've all been socialized into thinking, seeing, you know, different things. Um, and it's really interesting because I've got this little picture back here, which is called and she and it was given to me when I did a talk at a Federation for Medical Women of Canada event. And it was about um, an incident where uh, there were two medical students, a male medical student, a female medical student, and they were talking about a specific case. And the female medical student assumed that they were talking about a man because it was a physician. And he, the medical student, the male medical student went to her, he said, or she. And so that's the name of the, the picture is or she, because we assume um, as I had mentioned, uh, you know, in the case of um, in health sciences or in healthcare, uh, that people are going to be men. That's an example of, um, you know, a gender and unconscious gender bias. We have unconscious racial biases as well. We have unconscious biases around Indigenous peoples, and it has resulted in, you know, terrible mistreatment um, in our healthcare system. And so it's really important to break, to break those down. That's unconscious bias. Microaggressions are these little things that are said um, that undermine people's um, sense of accomplishment, their sense of worth. And, and some of that could be um, construed as positive, right? You're saying something nice about somebody. So, um, you know, commenting on women's looks um, as opposed to their um, achievements and particularly in, in, in certain contexts, right? In the context of job interview, why is that important for the job that you are applying for? Um, and so it has that sense of, it, it creates discomfort. It, um, and so if you feel discom discomforted by that, uncomfortable um, by that, it's usually a microaggression, but it's something that it's really difficult to kind of call out. It's not some of these like really explicit, you know, forms of sexism or racism. Sometimes there are those as well.
but the microaggressions are these little things that are said, um, you know, commenting on black women's hair, um, just anything that is to create the sense of other or um, to reduce one's sense of stature within a particular um, environment. And so in the toolkit, we have, um, you know, some examples of these and ways to become a more active bystander. So noticing them is one thing, doing something about it is the next thing. And that could be doing something yourself, or it could be asking somebody else to, to do that because it may just be too much emotional energy for you to do that. Good, great explanation, Ivy. Okay. Billy Jane, do you wanna add anything on that? No. <laughs> <laughs> it's no, so it's not. <laughs> yeah, and it's very, very comprehensive. And, yeah. um, and, you know, and it's something that I'm also still learning, you know, um, it, uh, it comes through in the research that I'm doing in my own thesis. And I'm in dietetics, I'm trying to understand what does that look like in my, my profession. Mm. Um, and, uh, and, even as a, an Asian woman, um, I'm even trying to um, I navigate that space myself and uh, just trying to be aware of the unconscious biases that I have or I might have um, as someone who um, has, has had the privilege to um, be born and raised here in Canada. Um, so I think um, it's something that I've uh, myself um, as a, uh, at my point in, in my career as a researcher, uh, just knowing sort of where my positionality. Um, mm. And I think that um, what uh, being a part of this project has enabled me to do is just really start to address um, who I am as a researcher. Um, what do I bring? And um, that idea of being curious and um, wanting to learn and learn from others. And um, uh, just recognizing uh, as well where I'm able to evolve and go from there. So my husband works for a male dominated engineering firm and he always says the girls in HR and I'm like, oh, no, 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 <laughs> don't do that. Um, so Ivy, I remember you saying that you're looking at doing a few case studies with organizations who have used the toolkit. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, thank you for thank you for that segue. Um, yeah, if there's anybody who would like to take elements of the toolkit, um, adopt them and adapt them in your organization, we're happy to support you um, in that. Um, if there, if you want to follow up with us and say um, we don't see anything here on this specific um, issue. Um, you know, we could look and see if there was anything else that came up. So there's, there's the stuff in the toolkit, there's a lot of stuff in the background, and there's a lot of stuff in the pipeline. Um, because in order to kind of get everything on the platform, we had to sort of curate everything and make sure that it worked and make sure that all of the links were updated. And so we've created these buckets for new stuff that we see. And so um, that's been Ruth's job. So she'll be presenting on the 29th uh, with me. So we've been putting some information in there. And um, and so absolutely do do reach out. Um, that would be that would be really important. And I, I also noted that um, I didn't know about sort of the registration for the uh, for the event. And these are some things that we all have to to kind of keep in mind that uh, we can we can be much more sort of open in terms of um, how we ask people to identify in terms of registration. So um, if you identify as male or female or that you don't identify as one versus the other or you're transitioning. Um, so yes, we can all adopt uh, these um, promising practices and be much more inclusive. So thank you for pointing that out. Good. Well, I don't see any more questions in the Q&A, so I'm going to wrap it up. So thank you, Billy Jane and Ivy. Fabulous, as always. I've heard this several times now, and I learn something every time. The videos on the toolkit with the leaders speaking, you know, it just brings back all the memories, and there's mm. so many pearls. So I encourage people to have a good poke at the toolkit. As uh, Roshni put in the chat box, uh, she sent the link on how you can access it. It is free to everybody. Um, if you forget later, there are instructions on how to access it both on uh, Leeds Canada and the CHLNet website. As Ivy mentioned, uh, part two of the webinars, um, 
on March 22nd, so in two weeks, and then the week following is March 29th. So the 22nd is on the important role men play in empowering women leaders, and the 29th is more on diverse leadership. And lastly, a little reminder that if you are a college member, these webinars qualify for one credit for the maintenance of certification requirement. So that's it for us. Thank you to you both. Fabulous job. Thank you. And I uh, hope everyone has a good day. Cheers. Happy International Women's Day. <laughs> Absolutely.